Uh, oh. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, so we are ready to start. Um, Hashan, could you give me present here? Please uh, wait for a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to put on the presentation till we start. As soon as you enable me, I'll start sharing. Sure. Okay. Give me two minutes. No problem. Okay. All right. Um, a warm welcome to everybody who has joined us today. Thank you for joining the fourth session organized by the student track of IEEE Region 10 SYW World Congress 2020. So the topic of today's student track is bridging the gap, career development, employability, and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I would like to welcome all of our distinguished keynote speakers, Prof. Saman, Dr. Dejan, Mr. Ken Stoffer, who would be represented by Mr. Thomas Minako, as well as our amazing moderators, Prof. Chris and Dr. Satrio, and of course, all of our participants who have joined us today. So. Um, over the years, the skills gap has become dauntingly evident as the perception between employers, educators, and students change every year so often. So education providers believe that their graduates are prepared to step into a career, but less than 50% of the youth and employers agree. So this webinar will focus on zeroing in on ways that this can be improved. So for that, we have with us three amazing speakers who are from the three main routes um, of how this issue can be looked at. We've got uh, Professor Saman from academia, Dr. Deshan from industry, and Mr. Ken Stopper, who is a self-made entrepreneurship entrepreneur himself. So I would like to start off this session by inviting our first keynote speaker, Dr. Dejan Milijojic, distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard Labs, Dr. Dejan will be speaking on the topic, an industrialist's perspective, education, and employability. Mm -hmm. So to give a small introduction to Dr. Dejan, he is a distinguished technologist and director at Hewlett Packard Labs, uh, Palo Alto. And previously, he has worked in the OSF Research Institute, Cambridge, and uh, the Institute Milato Pupin in Belgrade, Serbia. His areas of expertise include system software and distributed systems. He received his PhD from the University of Kaiserslautern, Germany, and for his master's and bachelor's from Belgrade University. So uh, Dr. Dejan is an IEEE fellow, ACM Distinguished Engineer, and HKN and Usenex member. He was the president of IEEE Computer Society in 2014, and was an IEEE presidential candidate uh, in 2019. He has been on many conference program committees and general auditorial boards. So Dr. Dejan, the screen is yours. Thank you very much.
can someone confirm if you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Natasha, and thank you, uh, everyone uh, from the organizing committee for inviting me and for my colleagues for uh, chairing the panel. Um, uh, I would like to first um, go a little bit about myself and provide that as an example towards the conclusions and recommendation. Uh, I'll go through my journey, my education and work, how I work with students. Um, then I do my homework that was given to me by the organizers. I'll go through lessons learned and then I'll provide some closing thoughts. If you don't get your answers or if you have some questions, you can connect to me through these links. So, um, as um, Tarushi already said, uh, I worked uh, in these institutions, uh, but last 20 years I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Silicon Valley, uh, largely talking to customers, various CTOs of, of, of a number of companies, uh, so I was heavily exposed to dynamic industry startups, venture capitalists. Uh, I think of myself as innovator, and I think I can transfer some of these experience, have about 60 patents, a lot of papers. Um, but more importantly, I think that I have a global reach over my career uh, and both um, technologists and management experience. So I manage teams in India, Brazil, Singapore, China, US, Canada, Costa Rica, many other places. I also work very closely and still work with various universities. So today I work with UIUC, Purdue, Georgia Tech, uh, ETH Zurich, Technion. I work with a number of um, companies when I was running cloud computing testbed called OpenSeries across the Asia, uh, Europe, and, and US. Within IEEE, as I, uh, as Tarushi already said, I was presidential candidate and I held a number of other positions. But what I'm really proud of are not these titles, but the various projects that I pursued. So for example, I introduced this prestigious Spirit of Computer Society Award. I wrote a CS 2022 report about seven years ago. I did a lot of technology predictions and, and, and many uh, other results. Uh, Travel-wise, I was born in Belgrade, uh, lived there for 31 years. Uh, I got uh, my degrees in Kaiserslautern or in Belgrade, also studied some things in Greece and UK, served army in Zagreb, but I visited many places. The reason I'm bringing it up is you really need unique uh, and global perspective if you want to advance. Uh, I moved from Belgrade to Germany in 91. Got my degree there, then moved to the East Coast, spent five years there, and then spent the remaining 22 years on the West Coast. Um, in your region, uh, Region 10, um, I visited a number of places in India, China, Malaysia, uh, Australia, Taiwan, China, Singapore. I managed a couple of few teams, one in India and China and Singapore. And then here are the locations of that cloud computing test bed. So there are, I think, at least six sites over there. I've been, done similar relationships in uh, South America, um, largely with Brazil, uh, managed the team there, uh, and had uh, a number of university collaborations that are still ongoing. My uh, path wasn't straightforward. I first finished Master's of Science and Bachelor, uh, then I um, worked uh, and uh, then went to, for PhD only after eight years and then went back to work in industry. So your path is never uh, one directional. But there's a lot of additional learning opportunities that further broaden my perspective. So I was interned in cement factory in Greece. Uh, that was in summer of 1982. Uh, I had some studies in UK. Uh, so you can see this factory over there by the beautiful coast and then the famous London Bridge. Languages are really important if you want to make progress. Uh, if you want to read these sentences, you need to speak either German, French, or Serbian. And it simply says that foreign languages are really, really important. Um, but most of the learning you do at work, I don't expect you to read all this. What I wanted to tell you that I switched between management and technical contributor a number of times through my career, and it was very important. And the technical topics were a variety. For all of these, I need to learn new things from operating systems, mobility, system management, research management, and many others. But you don't do only papers, you do patents when you're in industry. So I had a portfolio of patents. 
and here's that portfolio. Again, I don't expect you to read. What I want to emphasize is that these circle um, names are all students. So I did a lot of work on patents with students and with postdocs, and it's spread over all these areas. So uh, you have opportunity as a student to learn uh, by doing patents, not just by writing papers. And speaking of papers, this is only a subset of my papers. Again, the, the names in red are uh, students. In many cases, these are the lead authors. Here's the homework that I got from the organizers, what I was asked to do, and I mapped them on a number of questions and answers. Uh, how can countries best prepare uh, students to work? Well, they need to pay attention to relevant technologies and foster support educational systems. They should encourage students and professors to do a lot of cross-country exchanges. Uh, Germany does it, Brazil and France, many others. How to extend the skills? Well, it's lifelong learning. You don't just do it once. As I showed you, you, uh, you can do, uh, you have to study while you work, so the learning never stops. But you can do a lot of learning as a volunteer. Uh, top schools usually get more attention, but later on, it's only results that count. And many times GitHub, that is the code that you produce or whatever else you do, is much more important than LinkedIn resume. Uh, fresh graduates are in demand, they are cheaper, um, they think out of box, they're amenable to change, and they embrace opportunity. Not all skills are transferable, uh, but there are many complementary skills. And world is small, you can access all these courses now online. Um, there are a number of internship opportunities, practical projects, and I think that's the best way to learn. That's how I learned, by doing it at, at my future workplace internships. And uh, there are also a number of collaborative projects that you should explore. My lessons learned are that initial success are really important. The first impressions you make are, are really key. And uh, I've done that most recently with this industry spotlight example. And then you carefully grow proportional to the impact you make. Being connected is crucial uh, within your organization, across organization, across the world. Strategy is key, but execution is king. How you execute is really important. You keep, stick to your strategy, but you can change execution all the time. And there's no magic wand. Only hard work pays off. One has to be deeply engaged. Here are a number of changes that happen throughout the spotlight, industry spotlight podcast that I organize, and you have to adapt to all these changes. Here are some respectful suggestions for students and everybody else. I think it's very important to understand your strength and form a strategy that plays to your own strengths. Identify partners, work with them. A lot of people say think globally, act locally. I have a variation of that theme. Act locally, selectively collaborate globally with those people that you care. There are various theories about individual skills. Um, some people say that people can be broad, but usually they are not as deep in certain technologies. Then you have people who are very deep in certain areas, but are not broad. They're experts only in certain areas. Then there are T-shaped people who are really the most uh, important ones. They can be broad and they could be deep in one area. And very, very few are pie-shaped. But if you have an organization, then you can accomplish quite a bit by going deep in a number of uh, areas. Um, if you know yourself, that's really important. And there are a number of these tools. I, I don't wanna do the summary of this. There's Myers-Briggs, there's Social Styles, there's Enneagram, Discover Your Strengths. Social Styles is probably the simplest. Uh, they're driver, analytically amiable, and express. You know to know how, you need to know what kind of social style you are and then also understand how are the others and react with them because your social style may not match the social style you are talking to. And then that can be classified even further. I just populated the top right corner. So for example, my styles are in Myers-Briggs ENTJ, that's the uh, extrovert, uh, intuitive thinking and judging. In social style, I'm driver, driver all the way, top to the right. So usually I have most problems talking to amiable, amiable people, you know, because I need to give their uh, trust and show them love before we can engage in the Enneagram. I uh, asserter, my strengths are achiever, significance, arranger, communication, and learner. But all those are right. You just need to understand who you are. So advice to go forth, uh, and this is my last minute and conclusion of the talk. I think um, from my homework, conclusions are that ultimately industry selects but universities and government prepare future employees. Uh, 
more likely are students from universities uh, hired who you already collaborated with, with professors on collaboration projects. Top schools play an initial role, but impact and skills weigh much more long term. But ultimately, you have to keep on uh, learning all your life. General advice is that there's no single recipe. You have to grab opportunities as they open up to you. Uh, there's this famous um, a claim by Sun Tzu, opportunities multiply as they are seized, so don't lose the opportunities. And life will surprise you. You have to be ready and do not give up. Go extra mile, it will pay off eventually. It always did for me. Be ambitious, be bold, IEEE counts on you and the whole industry. You are, I guarantee you, at least twice better than our generation, at least four times better than me. So you can do it, start planning now. Don't wait till tomorrow, not even later today, right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dejan. So, uh, coming up next, our next keynote speaker will be speaking from an academic perspective to career development. So, I would like to introduce distinguished professor Saman Halgamuge from the University of Melbourne. Professor Saman Halgamuge is a fellow of IEEE. He received his bachelor's degree in electronics and telecommunication from the University of Morocco, Sri Lanka, and his PhD degrees in data engineering from the Technical University of Darmstadt, uh, Germany. He is currently a professor of the Department of Electrical, Mechanical and Infrastructure Engineering at the University of Melbourne, and an honor honorary professor of the Australian National University, uh, the Institute of Technology, Bandung, uh, Tongji University, and SLIT. Uh, he is also a distinguished lecturer of IEEE Computational Intelligence Society. He was previously director of the Research School of Engineering at uh, Australian National University. And um, he has had visiting professor appointments at several universities. His research interests are in AI, machine learning, including deep learning, optimization, big data analytics and their applications in energy, mechatronics, bioinformatics, and neuroengineering. So speaking on the topic, motivating and articulating a career in academia, please welcome Professor Saman Haldenke. Thank you very much, Natasha and the organizing committee. And uh, so I'll be talking about motivating and articulating a career in academia. And uh, um, obviously I'm referring to my own career, and uh, so I have prepared very few a uh, few slides, and uh, so maybe I start with explaining all this text in this first slide. So as you heard already, and uh, so uh, you can you can talk about uh, just a moment. I have to probably tell people not to make sound. Uh, no. I apologize for this. Just a moment. Uh, Nelanka, I'm talking at a conference. Okay, all right. So as my son is making quite a lot of sounds, so I have to tell him <laughs> not to make sounds. All right. So, um, um, so just to explain the first slide here. So, um, so I'm a fellow of IEEE, and uh, so I, this first line shows my education. So I've started uh, my undergraduate degrees in Sri Lanka, and then um, I moved to Germany to do higher education. So I did a master's degree there, and um, um, and then the PhD. So uh, so it's, it, there is a similarity to the previous speaker. So um, and and I'm also uh, doing quite a lot of IEEE work, and including um, speaking at conferences about computational intelligence and so on. So, um, so how do I get to this? And then you can see, um, I, I will come to that, and you will also see uh, that I have several honorary appointments. That means I don't get paid by them, so I do not work for them um, as, as an employee, uh, um, but I do quite a lot of work for them. I visit them if, um, at the moment, not, not anymore, but when the travel is allowed, I visit them, and uh, so there are different levels of these honorary appointments uh, as well. 
Okay, so um, so there are three things I want to talk about. And the first, the motivation. So why would someone become an academic? And uh, so as opposed to going to industry and work. So, and this is very personal for many people. And I, I was in industry as well. So I did some teaching as well. Um, and, 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 uh, and then I, I compare these two things and uh, and then I figure it out what I want to do. So I go into detail, uh, um, in detail, um, talk about the motivation. And then you have to plan. So once you know that this is what you want to do, so you have to plan and, and you have to get there. You have to find a position, a faculty position somewhere um, where you can actually be an academic. So now once you have got the job, now you are an academic, and what can you do, right? So, so those are the three things that I'm going to talk about. So motivation. So I put this provocative title, are you a detective? So that means are you curious? So are you going to spend some time um, trying to find new things? So I'm talking about research here. So in research, you, you, you want to push boundaries. You want to find things that, that you suspect is there. Sometimes you don't even know what you're looking for. So it, it is all about playing the role of a detective in, in, um, in this case, in engineering, but also related sciences. So I think that's the easiest way to explain that. So the other, other motivation point is, I mean, once you know that you are very curious, you want to know um, and, and things, you don't just accept the, an equation that, that someone teaches, um, um, put up, asks you to learn, um, but you want to know the background and you want to know how did this, this scientists or researchers or engineers come up with this sort of equations. And you want to need, need, learn a lot more than that people tell you, right? What, what are in the books? You need know, to think between the lines written in the books. So you are truly a detective because you, are, you, you have a mission to find these things. So if you have these sort of features, I think you could be good researchers. So do you feel happy when you teach? That's another aspect of being an academic. So you transfer knowledge and um, are you happy uh, when, you, when you get the opportunity to teach? So the third point is, um, do you value social contribution? Because most of the work we are doing, uh, we don't do um, to directly earn money. So sometimes the, the things we do may benefit the society in five years time, in 10 years time, and sometimes 50 years time. We do not know that, okay? So, so at the moment we have this terrible crisis and some of the research people have done 10 years ago, 20 years ago are now relevant. So I can look back and, and see how some of the PhDs we have completed and are going to be relevant in this context. So, um, so do you value social contribution? Do you, do you value that? Because you are making a scientific contribution and that may have direct impact now or much later, but it will have an impact. So if you, if you, don't, have, if you don't see an impact of what you do in research, so you probably shouldn't be doing that. So in, in general, as an academic, you do teaching, transferring, transferring knowledge, but you also do research. And then you do uh, quite a lot of community work. Um, you work with places like IEEE and so on. Okay, so now how do you get there? So now uh, generally, most academics need to have a PhD, but in some countries you can teach by having a postgraduate qualification like masters. So now, if you want to do a PhD, and fortunately or unfortunately, and many institutions will look at your grades and your language skills, okay? So I think you understand what I mean by grades, but the language skills is a bit difficult to explain. So it's not about learning a particular language. So when I went to Germany, and uh, I had to learn German first, so my German professor asked me how good I was in my mother tongue. I grew up in Sri Lanka, so I speak, uh, I speak Sinhala as a language in Sri Lanka. So they asked me, 
how good I was. Then I look back and how, how did I um, do in that my mother tongue? So then he told me, if you're good in your mother tongue, you'll be good in German. Okay, learn these things. It's a transformation of a thinking process from your mother tongue to a foreign language. So, so now the language skills are important because I mentioned that you do research and you, you need to be able to explain to someone of very complicated things that you are, you are doing in a language that they understand. So imagine that you, you discover something really wonderful and, but you cannot tell other people what it is. You cannot communicate, you cannot write a paper, you cannot write a patent, or you cannot just give a talk to explain that. That is terrible, okay? So, so those two things are important. So if you, the, what happens if you don't have the grades? For whatever the reason, you have done um, your first degree and you, your interest was somewhere else, or you didn't like the program uh, you were enrolled in in your first degree, so, you didn't get the good grades. What do you do then? Well, I mean, there are always different paths. So you can take uh, another degree, right? A different degree, and uh, and and something you can do something you like. And if you do something you like, and you do that well, and you get your grades, right? So then you can probably do a PhD or higher degree in that path. So in order to do and do a job in academia, you must have done something you really like. You and and whatever the education you have done, you must be very good at it. Okay, so that could lead to higher studies either in your own country or some other countries, depending on the opportunities. And so what happens there is that you get trained. So I would say I'm more interested in people doing a deeper, higher studies than its actual topic because it, it's a training that matters. So now once you have completed that, and then you have to find an academic job, which is probably not so easy in some countries, but perhaps relatively easy in other countries. So the planning takes quite a lot of time. So it's a long-term process. If you think about doing a PhD, it will take um, four years, six years, um, four to six years, I, I believe. And in most places, and uh, nowadays, and then an undergraduate degree, and perhaps a master's, another four to six years. So it might take quite a lot of time, something like a decade, that that you land on a job that you want to do. So that also tells you something about the the financial situation you are in. So you might not be very rich uh, if you have chosen this path, but I can tell you that the job satisfaction is quite high. And there's also a myth that once you are in academia that you don't have to um, deal with industry. That is wrong. So most of us work with industry uh, quite strongly. And uh, if you go to some other countries like, um, um, and you will see in China, I have a colleague and he has his uh, parallel company. So he's a company director as well as a professor, okay? So also in, 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 in the country I work, in Australia, some of my colleagues have their own companies, right? So you can have a dual role in academia and industry as well. So now the, the interesting point is maybe that helps you to motivate this point. So now you, are, you became an academic, you are an academic, and what now? What are you going to do? So what are the challenges? How it, how it is like being an academic, okay? So now, first thing I have to tell you is um, when you get to become an academic, probably after 10 years from the time that you enter the university, right? And inevitably, the student generation have, they, has changed. So, so you'll be teaching to students a lot long, younger than you and a lot different than you, okay? So this is something you have to understand. So you should be prepared to teach in a way that the younger generation, the current students, would understand you. So when I was a student, I am used to learn from people who use a chalk and a blackboard and they write things and explain to you. Okay, I could sit there for hours and, 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 and try to understand what is going on. But nowadays, it's different. So in 10 years time again, it will be very different. So. You should understand what are the technological differences, what are the differences of the, the student generation, and how do they absorb information, 
what is the tension pan, uh, pan and what are the tricks that you have to use to communicate with the generation in 10 years time. So you have to learn that. So it's not straightforward. So now the research directions also change. Sometimes your preferences change. So when I entered the research, I've never done anything with biology because I'm an engineer. So I've never learned biology properly. But now if you look at it, half of my research group is, is working uh, on algorithms in biology. So we learn um, um, from our collaborators things about viruses, bacteria, cancer, imaging. It's all related to medical and biology. So half of my group is working in that area. So research directions changes because your preferences changes. And it's also possible that the society changes its preferences, okay? So renewable energy and uh, climate change and now big topics. So there are lots of research associated with it. And, and this pandemic gives you a completely different direction. It's not different that much, but a strong direction of research uh, involving not only health, but also social interactions during these sort of times. And also the engineering, the, the IT and Everything has is changed. It's a disruptor. So the, the COVID-19 crisis we have now is a disruptor. So what happens to the world afterwards? So you should be able to see that. And there will be research directions. You have to adapt, okay? So now, if you look at these two things, two points, and you will realize that you will never be bored. So you have to adapt with the change. It's never going to be boring routine. So you have to adapt with the change. And then there are lots of strategic aspects. So it's not just being clever, but also being strategic. Okay, so how do you align yourself with the strategic changes happening around science, research, engineering, and so on? And one good way to be in touch is to be involved in places like IEEE. So, um, so I'm engaging with IEEE. I have been doing that since my undergraduate years at the University of Morocco in Sri Lanka. So how do we actually work with the changing, strategically changing technological world is my uh, last point. So um, thank you very much for listening. So if you have any, any um, questions that you want to ask me, and uh, I, I know that we have a panel discussion, but um, if you want to contact me, this is my email address. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Samuel. That was an amazing uh, keynote. Um, so moving forward to our final keynote speaker, he will be focusing on how students can move out from the conventional approaches after finishing their um, relevant degrees and foster their own creative space. He will also give insights on how IEEE entrepreneurship can help students develop an entrepreneurial career. So for that, we have with us Mr. Ken Stoffer, Chair of IEEE Entrepreneurship 2020, who is unable to join us virtually, but he has sent us a pre-recorded video presentation. So to give a small introduction to Mr. Ken, he has spent 30 plus years in the telecommunications industry. He began his career at AT&T Bell Laboratories in Homedale, NJ, after receiving his AAS from Wong uh, College. And um, at Bell Labs, Ken worked in data services performance, where he and the team designed a system called Packet Aspen. Ken left AT&T in 2000 to become an entrepreneur as part of a management team founding Epic Communications a 460 million startup in Florida. He also led a team to create the vision for the NAP in 2011 of the Americas in Miami. In January 2003, Ken uh, formed the Technology Assurance Labs to provide consulting design and testing services to venture capital groups, network equipment manufacturers, and service providers. He also founded Cypress Equipment, a product sales company. Starting in 2010, Technology Assurance Labs develops RFID products for the rail industry and IoT products for the propane and natural gas industry. 
Ken served as COE for both companies for 15 years before stepping down to become the chair of uh, the board of directors. He currently chairs the IEEE Entrepreneurship Committee and speaking on the topic, the third way, becoming an entrepreneurial star, this is Mr. Ken Stoffer's video presentation. Uh, just to make sure, I hope the video is audible to everybody. This is Chris. I couldn't hear it. Uh, give me a, one moment. Okay, thank you. This is Tom. I also cannot hear the video. One moment.
Is there any issues? Taru, can you hear me? Uh, Peshan, could you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you, Shari. Uh, there, there's a tech, kind of a technical issue from Taru's uh, end. Right. Uh, in this case, maybe we can move on to the panel discussion and then get back yes, to Ken's okay. talk afterwards. Will that work? Yeah, that will be good. All right. Okay. Um, Prof. Chris and um, Dr. Santrio, would, it, would you mind to please uh, carry on with the panel discussion while we'll solve the technical glitch with uh, Ken's talk? Uh, thank you very much uh, to Shabi, and also um, thank you very much to the excellent uh, keynote speakers by uh, uh, Dr. Regen uh, Milojevic and also Professor Samet Hala uh, Gam Gamuk. Um, I think we are now, Region 10 is a very vibrant region. Now we are um, right now in the middle of, uh, we're right now in the middle of Industry 4.0. Because um, if I remember, starting from uh, Industry 1.0, where people were starting to have these uh, traditional uh, artisan uh, craftsmanship. Now, because of uh, the Industry 1.0, which was uh, uh, more on the um, more on energy, and uh, 2.0, which is more on electricity, things got outdated. So that actually changed um, the way not only for science, but also the social structure and also the economical, economical structure. So um, there were different ways in which uh, young people, especially students, had to learn. So uh, there was a change in terms of the workplace also, because they need to be able to get education and be adapted and go back to the workplace again. Now you see that today uh, in the middle of um, Industry 4.0, with uh, big information and also artificial intelligence. Things are changing so fast, and the scope of changes are also being very fast. Now, uh, in addition to that, we also are looking at pandemics, where uh, people are experiencing lockdowns, and also we are looking at uh, different uh, you know, remote learning and also uh, working from home. Now, um, in addition, uh, there are also entrepreneurs, which uh, Ken was going to uh, talk about. Now, uh, in entrepreneurs, uh, people are looking at more at uh, more startups where there is a shift of work modality. So you see that people are also uh, not only working in uh, big corporate research, but now because of startups, uh, people will need to work from home. So from all these perspectives, uh, I would like to. Uh, ask uh, our two uh, excellent and also international, not only industry, but also academia leaders on um, what are some of the things that we should teach the students looking at all these environments? What are things that they need to learn? I know um, you have both already addressed this. So um, I have uh, typed two questions uh, for um, say, for example, for uh, Dehan, you're an in the industry leader. Uh, what are some of the cultural differences that you see amid the pandemics? Like you have been uh, doing your undergraduate education in Europe and you are an industry leader in the United States. You have traveled to Region 10. What are some of the uh, things that you would like to uh, teach our students in Region 10? Right, so the path from uh, from uh, from academia to industry smoother, right? Yeah. So th thanks for extensive um, uh, question. I, I think um, academia already teaches students uh, about the technology, uh, and uh, that, that's the basis that is really important. But once you get to the workplace, things are completely different. You get a problem to solve. Um, at the moment, I am the manager and have situations where. Um, you know, you don't um, necessarily know how to work with other people if the young PhD student comes to work. 
uh, he does not necessarily have has the uh, the good instincts to solve the problems. You know, he's still trying to uh, perfect it, to come up, analyze it, etc. Whereas you have experienced engineers who know that 80-20 rule that you know uh, you need to spend um, you you need to come to the 80 percent of the solution that will probably is good enough, and that the perfection is. Um, enemy of the good enough and, and, and we need to do the good enough things. And also, you know, there are different personalities as I was trying to point out. So uh, you have people who want to come to that solution quickly and then there's a PhD student who wants to, you know, do analysis to the end and, and then there's mistrust. And, uh, and, and these are things that students don't necessarily get taught at the university. Uh, and um, but they could potentially, you know, if they go to practice, if they do internships, if they do collaborative projects, they can do a lot of these things. The other thing is, and I think uh, Region 10 is probably better at that compared to homogeneous environments like United States, where people primarily think about, you know, from the U.S. perspective. But every single culture has different behaviors. So. You know, it took me a while to understand how people think in China, how they behave in Japan, how they act in India. Even Australia is different than U.S. Australians are much more like Europe, for example, than their United States. So understanding these behaviors while working with these people is really important to build rapport. Once you have built rapport, then you can keep on doing, you know, you can make mistakes later, but, you know, uh, that that it's forgiven, but the first impressions are most important. So I encourage everyone to be open uh, and think about it. The other thing is, and I'll be uh, very quick, uh, I think students uh, coming to industry need to be bold and ambitious, but also they need to be patient and, and, and realize uh, their level of skills. Uh, just like today, I got a, a fresh PhD student who asked me to be a reference for him uh, for the major award in uh, IEEE Computer Society. So you have to, as, as you know, as a senior member, as a fellow of IEEE, I have to be very careful to explain to the person that his ambition is really great and, and I applaud to it and I applaud to all his results, but you know, he is no way comparable to the other uh, recipients of the awards who have been working for decades. So these are some of the advices I would like to make. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And also, um, I have similar questions also for uh, Professor uh, Salmon. Yes. Uh, did I pronounce your name correctly, Professor, uh, Professor Salmon? Yes. It's good. Yes. Thank yeah. You. Um, I think you are also very international. Uh, I think it's very impressive how you uh, were like, you know, from Sri Lanka originally, and then you got your uh, PhD in Germany, right? And then you go to uh, Australia. Now you're teaching in the University of Melbourne. Now, um, one of the things I, um, I, I'm still trying to get to the cultural question because I see that these are all leaders. Now, um, when I was uh, working as a um, system architect, the former Phillips Semiconductor in uh, Sunnydale, um, my boss was saying, uh, my Dutch boss was saying, hey, Chris, how come you never voice out your technical opinion? And we were taught to be modest. We didn't want to challenge people directly because of the culture, because of the Taiwanese, because of the Asian culture. Right. But then my Dutch boss was saying, now, Chris, in the United States or in, in Europe, if you don't voice out what you think, people may think that you don't know the, thing, the, the, the things. Now, what do you see in terms of the cultural differences? But, you know, coming back to Taiwan to teach, sometimes uh, students or even colleagues get offended if you, you know, challenge them in terms of, uh, right, do you see similar problems for your academic and industry setup? Right. So this is industry and also international culturally. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, since you mentioned Taiwan, and I will I will start with an example. Uh, my first PhD student I had at the University of Melbourne, I think one of the first, 
uh, he was originally from Taiwan. And uh, so now he did ex extremely well uh, in his PhD, and, uh, but he had other ambitions. So I, I, I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning it here. One ambition was to become a golf player, professional golf player. So he said, I want two years and uh, I play golf. It, if it doesn't work, I'll then I'll come back. So I said, yes, follow your passion. So I gave him two years break somewhere. And my condition was that one day per week, he has to work on his PhD. So I didn't see him for those two years. He tried to be a professional golfer, and he realized that's too hard to achieve, and then came back. So young people have ambitions, and uh, so I think that is related to my ambition. So his ambition was different. So now, how did he benefit from it? So when I look back, among all the PhD students I had, I had about 40 of them graduating from my group in the past, and uh, this person is the richest because he started his company in Taiwan, a bioinformatics company, and then uh, he became very successful and he used the research that he did in my group and, and the skills, research skills he learned. And he's also a graduate of University of Melbourne and he combined that with the business thinking and ambition he had. So, and now he's a, um, he's a really influential person in the bioinformatics industry and he's doing so well and occasionally we, we publish together still and and uh, we have a good connection but now i think the the ambition of a young person should not be underestimated so my ambition so that this is how it links to the question you have asked so my ambition when i was um, a graduate engineer in a Ceylon electricity board so uh, fixing um telecommunication industry, uh, equipment in power industry. That was my first job as an engineer. So, um, and I, I, I looked at it and I thought, okay, if I keep doing this for many years and I will lose my edge um, for innovation or my ambition. At that point, I decided now, uh, what did I do for so well in the past and I loved doing it. And then when I look back and I realize I taught um, uh, um, voluntarily, I taught a small class of students in, a, in, in Sri Lanka somewhere. And that was the happiest time in, 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 in kind of my life. So I, lo I love teaching. I realized that. And then I thought, okay, so how do I go from here to become a teacher and, uh, um, and, and of course, in my contest, it is to become a professor. So it's very personal. It's a personal ambition for me to be able to do something I love and then also getting paid for it, right? So that, that is what I wanted. So, but however, working in industry for a while helped me to understand the, 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 the side that I, I had to collaborate and I, I kept collaborating. Um, and, and as an academic, because in academia, in engineering, is rarely, we, we can really survive without uh, the close collaboration, close relationship to industry. So, so this, is, this is, I think, uh, the, being there in industry for a while helped me to, to, um, to have my academic career um, going very nicely, and, uh, but also to collaborate with industry more uh, while uh, while I'm teaching at a university. So the values, which values did I take from the industry? And for example, um, if I get a faulty machine, I have to fix it, all right? So now to fix that machine, I have to use whatever available. So this is slightly different to the way some, some academic thinking. So now I have a, this wonderful technique all right, so now what can I do with this technique? So that's the other way to look at it. But you can have a problem, problem solving um, attitude. So now I have this problem I need to solve and I would use any technique available to do that. So that, that is a different way of thinking in academia as an applied research thinking. So I, I use both. So I do fundamental research to invent new methods, new algorithms and um, 
and I also do applied research to solve a serious problem um, in, in, um, in collaboration with uh, my friends in neural engineering, um, in, in viral genomics, and so, or cancer research, and so on, or energy industry. So, so I have this mixture, and um, I think thanks to my experience in industry, so I, I was able to understand um, in early enough in my career that I need both to survive. Yes. Um, so can I also answer another question on, on this? And it's coming from um, um, one of the organizers, Savitya Sivakumar. And yes. um, any tips to maintain a good balance between teaching and research work? Well, um, th this actually depends on your institution. So in my institution, University of Melbourne, uh, even if I want to be um, spending 90% of the time in teaching, so if I wish uh, to do that, and um, then I think I will be in trouble because without doing good research, it's very difficult to survive and as an academic. So the balance actually depends on what is the expectation of your employer. But I have colleagues who have teaching intensive careers, and they probably end up doing only 10% of research and 90% of teaching. But in my case, it is about 50% of research and, and probably more, and 30% of teaching, and um, 20 to 30% of teaching, and the rest is about engagement, engaging with um, organizations, IEEE and travel into other countries, other companies in, in, um, in other universities. So I work with companies in Germany, of course, and Sri Lanka, Taiwan, China, um, even South Korea, um, and, and to give you a few examples. And uh, so um, that th those, those, those engagements take quite a lot of time. So it, it's actually the three strands of being in academia. So I didn't tell much about the engagement strand. So teaching, research, and engagement, and we have to maintain a balance. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, very insightful uh, discussion with us. I think uh, I need to go to class in about 10 minutes. So could I ask one last question? Uh, supposedly for Ken, but I see that now, Tom, are, are you able to answer the question on behalf of uh, on behalf of Ken? Would that? Uh, right. I will do my best to right. answer the question on behalf of Ken. <laughs> right, right. You see that uh, we have all these uh, leaders right now. I'm very excited to have, like, say, a uh, Dijon and also Salmon. Uh, now you see that um, we um, all went to United States uh, for graduate school. Now you see that. In the very beginning, um, a lot of entrepreneur actually started from these, uh, you know, uh, foreign students, if you would. Uh, say, for example, uh, I think if I remember correctly, uh, Dijon, um, Intel's CEO Andy Group was also from Europe, right? Yeah. And now you see that um, Alphabet's CEO is from India. And also, uh, Microsoft CEO is also from India. And Vidya's CEO is from Taiwan. Now, my advisor used to tell me he's also from Taiwan. He was saying that he sees all these people from Europe, from India, and also from Taiwan, and now also, of course, from China. Everybody's very smart. But what he observed was saying that uh, the Europeans and also the Indians are very strong in language. Now, um, they're also more proactive. Now, even if, say for example, the Taiwanese um, are very good, we're also very smart, but sometimes we are shy to express. So you do see that now, even like for example, MIT's uh, engineering dean, uh, also a good friend of mine, Chandra Kassan, is also from India. So, um, as an entrepreneur, because we all went to the United States for the great American dream, as an entrepreneur, do you see uh, if these cultural difference from Asia, from Europe, will make a difference in pursuing their great American dream uh, when in the United States, Tom? 
<laughs> that's a that's very, very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very <laughs> difficult question to, <laughs> to answer. Um, so uh, I appreciate the question, first of all, and I just want to say thank you for uh, for inviting us to participate. I think that this is a great event and a great discussion. Um, with re with regard to your question, um, you know, entrepreneurship looks a little bit different in in every country, right? Um, and while a lot of people come to the United States for, for their degrees and then, you know, start businesses elsewhere um, to try to recreate that American dream, um, sometimes it, it, it works depending on things like, uh, you know, intellectual property laws and the way governments are set up and so on and so forth. And, and sometimes, it you know, I don't want to say it doesn't work, but it just it looks totally different. And, you know, um, to, to speak to our program a little bit rather than <laughs> answer a very, very complex question that uh, you know, could look completely different in, in 50 different ways. Um, what we do in IEEE Entrepreneurship is support um, you know, young aspiring entrepreneurs often coming out of tech, transfer, uh, tech transfers um, at universities uh, all over the world. Uh, we do uh, a ton of work with students in Africa and Asia, um, and we support um, this aspiring entrepreneurial activity in, in many, many different ways. Um, we've launched a Founders Office Hours program so that young students and um, you know PhD students who are who are hoping to spin some of their research out into you know a full-time business and you know hopes to hope to scale that business one day um, have a place to go to connect with uh, entrepreneurs and mentors. Um, who are, are, you know, incredibly seasoned with 20, 25, 30 years of experience. Um, these people are serial entrepreneurs who are just, you know, really insightful um, in not only um, what, you know, the business looks like in their home country, but who have, you know, uh, uh, worldly knowledge and, you know, a lot of great experience um, that they can, you know, offer up to, you know, these aspiring people. Um, we also offer... Um, pitch training um, so that when, you know, you're a young student and you've got a great idea, you can articulate what that idea is, you know, to your point about being, you know, good about sometimes language and whatnot. We we work to overcome those language barriers um, and do one-on-one -on -one training for free. You don't even have to be an IEEE member um, with people um, because it's important to have that, you know, kind of entrepreneurial um, uh, dream uh, be, uh, you know, uh, to, to follow that entrepreneurial dream with as few barriers as possible. So we do pitch training, we do in intensive pitch training, so you can deliver deliver a successful elevator pitch, um, whether that be in the U.S., or your home country, or, or wherever. Um, we have a 13-course roadmap, or we're developing a 13-course roadmap um, on, on topics like intellectual property, um, so that, you know, engineers who are, you know, again, aspiring entrepreneurs can, can uh, have a little bit of a, a, a peek and, a, and a, um, some insight as to where to go because there are so many things you need to know when you, you start your entrepreneurial journey. There's a lot of, you know, soft skills and there's a lot of business management that just isn't obvious, you know, right away to somebody who is, you know, thinking about this kind of career path. So in our program, and I hope you get to see Ken's video, there's a lot of support and a lot of services that we offer um, so that um, regardless of where you studied or where you where you came from or where you're going, you know, we can help you to achieve, uh, you know, uh, all your aspirations as a, you know, an entrepreneur um, because it's a, it's a, you know, a non-traditional career path that it's, you know, exciting in many ways. Um, and, uh, you know, we fully support um, the engineering driven aspiring entrepreneur. Yes, that was that was really excellent, right? I think um, because of time, uh, I apologize that I have to leave early. Thank you all so much for the three great speakers, and I think I'll hand this over now to uh, my colleague, uh, Satrio, uh, Dr. Satrio. Yes. Me, Dr. Okay, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. Before, before you move on, shall we take a group photograph so just so that you're going to be included? So I'd yeah. like to ask all the panelists to turn on their camera for the photograph. Okay. Okay. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, I'm I'm on a desktop without a computer right now, but I'd be happy to submit a placeholder headshot or, or something for a for the photograph. Yes. Okay. So I'm taking. 
All right. Thank you very much, Prof. Chris. Um, thank you for moderating the panel discussion thus far. And before I move on to Dr. Satrio, I think Dr. Zia had a small question, and so he has raised his hand. If I can ask a question to DJ. Sure. Is that okay or if I can ask a question? Okay. My question is to Dejan. Obviously, that PhD, fresh PhD who came to the foundation for an award was a good example of lack of self-awareness. Uh, Dejan, you mentioned that opportunities multiply as they, they are seized. Uh, is there a link between people who seize opportunities and people who have high level of self-awareness and awareness about the world around them? And if there is a link, um, uh, there is a correlation, then how can young people really enhance their self-awareness and awareness about the world around them uh, without going through a coaching by expensive consultants? Well, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. I think if these young people reach out to you, to me, to uh, other, uh, volunteers here, uh, they can get excellent advices. Um, just like I help that student or like I'm helping uh, at work people who I manage. There's also mentorship at work. Uh, I mentor, you know, I'm, um, uh, I have 35 years experience and I still reach out to mentors. Uh, and uh, I work with them and, and I share my experience with them. They advise me. Uh, there's um, Always opportunity to learn. Uh, IEEE is good. I'm not trying to now do the marketing for IEEE. There are other organizations. These organizations help you because they put you in the position uh, to either succeed or fail. Uh, and, and usually it's the safe environment. So, for example, I was on the board of IEEE, and that would be equivalent of being on the board of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And I doubt that I will get to that level. Uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise ever. Uh, but, you know, I was in the position to do that inside of IEEE. I was able to see the auditing of the whole uh, IEEE. That means understanding uh, every single business of a half a billion dollar uh, corporation, which is IEEE. So I strongly encourage uh, students to volunteer, be it in IEEE or other organizations. I hope it's IEEE. They can learn a lot. IEEE has its membership as well, uh, has the mentorship program as well. But I think just going and doing various things uh, is most useful. So throughout my career, you know, I just started first writing the papers, then suddenly I was on the program committees, then I became program chair of the conference, then I got on the editorial board of a journal, then I got on to become editor-in-chief, got on the publications board, on board of computer society president. You can very quickly go and you observe and people give you uh, feedback. If nothing else, when you go to these nominations and appointments committee, uh, they sometimes nominate you, other times they don't. Sometimes they give you feedback. Then there's also growth through uh, elevation of the membership. So it's good to become senior member, then strive for fellow, uh, and then some other organizations have similar things. And then you can grow both professionally at either industry or academia. So there are all these kinds of gradings that never stop really, you know? Uh, you think that by finishing university you're done, but you're not. You're just beginning really. Uh, but but I, for me, mentoring uh, is is really useful. Thanks for the question. It was a great question. And good seeing you, Zia, again. Uh, I think we met in Australia last time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zia. <laughs> um, so, uh, apologies that we could not play Ken's video previously. So I would like to. Um, call Ms. Amir to play the video from Ken Stoffer before we move on with the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, 
Haru, is video uh, is visible? Yes, it is. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ken Stauffer, and I'm the current chair of ID Fully Entrepreneurship. And I'm going to give a talk today on what's all about ID Fully Entrepreneurship and Entrepreneurship Stars. So let me start the recording here and let me bring up the slide deck. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm the chair of ID Fully Entrepreneurship. I have my background is that I was actually uh, have my degree in lighting and I worked in the labs for 15 years. Um, and then in 2000, around 2000, I went up to start a really large company in Florida. And uh, it was a $463 startup. And I was the uh, chief technology officer and the senior vice president of engineering. And uh, we scaled up very quickly and we got a big organization very fast. After school back from being about 2000, um, I started to meet a couple other companies, uh, technology insurance labs. The service company, and then I also started a product company uh, developing our products, and I see products and products. I ended up about four companies, but it makes them small and uh, the products and the service. So I am concerned about what I've heard and what I'm hearing. Our talk today is going to be about who we are, what we do, and how you can join us. This is all about IP. This is our 2020 Actually Entrepreneurship Steering Committee. As you can see, it's a very diverse global group of people. We have great ideas from our diversity, better influence, better planning, and all that. If you want to learn anything more about these people, you can go to our website there, and you can look at their bio. There's no particular order. Picture, I just want to give you a view of our, our steering committee. So our mission is very much like I Believe, which is to foster entrepreneurial engineering. That's really the idea of the our focus on entrepreneurs in this particular um, setting. One of the big goals we have this year is stress and sustainable development goals that we might put out. There's 17 goals. You can go look them up. Goals were supposed to be implemented by 2030, which is probably like nine years away or ten years away, just to tie it down. Um, and you can see the different goals there. So we love to support companies, entrepreneurs who are helping people in a better place. A lot of areas that are planning areas for people to get involved. That's what we're looking for. So that's stress and sustainable development goals. And it's important because it helps people in general around the world have a better life. Our goals uh, really are to be relevant to engineering driven startups. And the reason I stress this relevance thing is I when I left the lab and I was very much involved in research, I was involved in the computer society and communication. I view as my narratives. Um, and I went to become an entrepreneur. I found myself sensitive in trying to understand sales, marketing, business models, all the stuff you need to do to run a company. And as a CEO of a company, you really do have to understand all those things in order to make it work. So I didn't find IGBE to be very relevant for about 
you about another challenge that we do in the video calendar with your major conference on global social technology. And it's all about reading the web SDKs. So we partner with TAC and so we do web reading for women and children. We do this video for the applications quite a bit. It's a worldwide last year. We had 72 videos from 34 countries. This year we're just beginning to start doing it. We have close to 10,000 videos from around 20 countries. And we judge them all in fields of faith categories. As I mentioned before, with monetization, startup, and growth. I'll show you who the winners were last year. Um, we had the ideation ones guided from non invisible design. We had somebody from Singapore and Prince Pat who was the heavy startup winner. And we had Ted Ben. Ted Ben uh, from India was the sustainability growth category. And he was in also in another society called Cells where they had a power in a million lives. So, so we do it a lot of uh, work across different organizations and sectors. One of the things I personally like best is our personal budget for getting the essential people in the shop. So that's my name. We do a lot of mentoring in founders office hours, and uh, we mentor around the world all types of people. That's a big um, product that we call product. Definitely a service we put out on our web. So if you want to go look on our website, you can find it, founders office hours and get mentoring to guide uh, people. And then the last one, or the one at the bottom here, is the Agile Bush Entrepreneurship Workshop for Engineers and Scientists. Another one called Innovation Nation. This is where we go into countries, hold workshops, things to help entrepreneurs and to learn their skills. And those are all very personal and sensible so working out. Hope people are not using the video and sharing like that. If you went to our website, which you should go to, you would see the great resource index there. There's the Startup Research Index, which is worldwide, global, talks about accelerators, universities, co working spaces. And you can also find this career center, which is a happy sort of career looking for people in your company or just want to look for a job. It's not a leadership career research center or career center. So make sure you use those two uh, resources that we have on our website. I promise to show you what we did this year. You can see it's quite busy. We did a lot of stuff this year. We did uh, conferences, events, different reading meetings, I'm talking to you, and student conferences. You can meet up there. And a lot of our community meetings and other conferences are coming on. IDE, IG, we're doing uh, one a week on campus. Um, and then do we do other things about science? We did IDE one of the our events with the G-SPIN, like Monsumer Academy with Power Africa, Women Engineering Summit, and I got to do Palo Panda. We also do IDE on some of their, their stuff. So we do work with a lot of different groups. And as I said before, we're made up of all these groups. There are women in engineering, we have professionals in our entire group. We have 20 people in our group, so we're basically looking like a microphone for all the different groups. So then here comes the part that I feel like you're in the kitchen the most is how can you join us? The best news here is it's free. You just go to uh, you know, one of these places that's very big point and sign up. There's no cost at all. You can be in our newsletter, you can be part of the exchange community. A whole bunch of stuff you can do. You can see the groups. If you have an entrepreneurial event, you can get promoted. We are promoting these events on our website so you get a little bit more including. That's really, in a nutshell, what I can do. I'm here to move out. I hope you will be taking your questions. If I was there, I would be answering questions live, but doing all of this virtual right now, I travel over there and do the virtual kitchen. So look forward to later on talking on the panel discussion about the thinking and on the final. Thank you very much, Ms. Amir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ken Stoffer and also uh, Mr. Thomas Monaco for uh, being present today and for sharing that video with us. So, um, Dr. Satrio, back to the panel discussion. Okay. Thank you, Marushi. Uh, so, uh, we already have a very insightful discussion with uh, Dr. Chris, and now we we almost have a limitation of time. We still have about uh, 10 minutes less. So, uh, uh, due to the limitation of the time, I, I would like to go through the 
discussion, continued discussion. So with uh, Dr. Chris, we already discussed about uh, international employability. Currently, we have to discuss about uh, interdisciplinary career pathways and also career development amidst pandemics. Uh, yeah, uh, based on the uh, presentation, Dr. Dijan and Professor Saman both mentioned in his talk about changing priorities of students from generation to generation. For example, uh, last uh, 25 years, actually in my time, electrical engineering is the only option if we would like to go to the telecommunication industry. There is no other option. However, today everybody can have the opportunity to work in the telecommunication industry from the uh, different uh, major study. So, uh, Dr. Dijan, could you please also share what is your uh, strategic uh, suggestion to the student to uh, to really uh, choose the, the future in terms of the uh, uh, area that uh, they would like to uh, choose? Dr. Dijan? Yeah. So, um... I think I understand that in some regions, in some countries, some of the technologies are not as popular or are not as promising for the future employment. But the world has become very small nowadays. So if you don't find something in your country, you can go elsewhere. The reason I um, left Serbia was to do PhD in Germany. But then I realized that I cannot continue uh, working at the level, increased level of research in uh, Europe anymore, not even in Syria, but in, in the whole of the Europe. It changed uh, after I left, but that's why I went to the United States. Uh, I had opportunities, for example, to work in Germany, in France, but I chose the United States because that's where I could do most of my research. So it's similarly true for students in, in Region 10, in Asia Pacific, if, for example, you don't have in your country, there are other neighboring countries where you can do that work. Um, but also, uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, explore other options. If you are really into telecommunications, for example, there's no opportunity to do telecommunications. Explore other opportunities. That's another way around. And in terms of interdisciplinary things, I think we are all becoming interdisciplinarians. Uh, I think Professor Simon. Uh, he spoke about switching to biology. For example, I started with operating systems, but I've done so many other things. So you got to solve the problem that is there. You don't start with a solution. You know, you never start with, uh, uh, they say when you are a hammer, everything is a nail. Uh, but you have to, yeah. you, you really have to see what is the problem in your country and then try to help your country. Or if you are really into something else, then go where there are problems. But again, start with the problems and help solving those problems rather than insisting or I am I only want to do this. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dijan. Uh, very insightful uh, suggestion. So we have to thinking about the, the, the country, uh, the contribution to the society, the country, as well as the, the, the world. So uh, I think we have to really strategize our future uh, and we have to choose the, the the direction based on the future so uh professor saman uh, could you please also give us a uh, strategic thought about uh, this uh, topic yeah okay just to um so the, the question is about um understanding the current situation and and also the changing student generations but also the changing the normal what we call normal because of the pandemic right and and yeah. is, is that correct yeah so those are yes, yes, correct. my thoughts on okay um the changing student generation is um their thoughts what they want to do and it's um it's continuous it has been going on the the reason why um, why the universities are feeling um, uh, 
right now is because the pace at which it changes has increased. Okay, so now, um, quite honestly, in most of the classes, and when we go to teach, and we don't see a full lecture hall because we record our lectures and the, rec the, the recordings are on the web. So some students decide, okay, why should I go? I, I can just sit down, sit, sleep in, in, you know, in my bed and I can watch all these lectures. So yeah. now, and, and so now this, some of my colleagues do not understand it and they, they, they feel very um, insulted because um, and students do not come to lectures and they depend on the recording, right? So yeah. now the reason for that is, and you may be delivering um, your best as a lecture, but the, the students have access to uh, courses from MIT, courses from Stanford, and, and uh, so colleagues who can teach well and their lectures are there as videos, right? So they have a lot more resource, resources now than 10 years ago. So therefore the, the way you teach has to change. And, but then again, if we assume that students learn from these 10 different videos and you can have a discussion about the content with the students because they are now well informed, then it's, it's again wrong, right? And that doesn't work either. So you have to find a balance and how do you actually get um, students to um, look at some of the material available and how do you allow them enough time to do that? So that you can have an intelligent conversation with them, so that they are not bored. Um, and but if you if you try to give a parallel lecture to a lecture that is given by your colleague at Berkeley, right? And they they very nice that they filmed that, and it's there. So if you just ignore that, it's not going to work either. So you have to find the balance. So the change in generation is is more like changing circumstances. So information is no longer restricted it's available so it's about how do you use that information cleverly to have an intelligent conversation with your students I think that is a challenge and there are no easy answers so coming back to the COVID situation and um, so um, this is difficult right how do we get back to university how do we get back to um, a normal um, rhythm is very challenging so now at the moment, we teach online, right? And we assume to teach and so on. It seems to work somehow, but it's not ideal. So the students do not feel it is ideal. So now we, we are in a sort of, as, as an academia, we are, we are in a sort of crisis to find the right way to communicate with the students. This is my personal view. So we really do not know precisely how we actually communicate because of the generational change and um, availability of information. And on that, on one side, and then the COVID situation um, pushing us to, to move as much as possible to online education, but then, then keep the interaction, the personal interaction, the mentorship, direct interactions to, to, to the level where, you know, which is necessary. Okay, so and then the we can do all these beautiful things, but the students all, all students have a limited amount of time to study as well. So I don't have answers, but I can put the problems and saying that we need to find a solution. Because at the moment, and I can't see an ideal um, t teaching um, and learning environment happening, and in most of the places. So that is my answer. And probably I didn't answer, but I put put more more questions and, and explain the situation. Okay. Yes, I think a very good answer, Professor Saman. Yeah, because uh, we have to be careful to choose our future. Therefore, we have to really understood about the current situation. Yes, and uh, one other question uh, related to the. Uh, interdisciplinary career, uh, competing a job opportunity is really tough, especially in the countries when uh, too many high level education and skill are available. As mentioned by Dr. Chris, even too very difficult, some uh, Indian engineers are really successful. 
they have become a C-level in the top uh, corporation in the world. So uh, what is uh, your uh, suggestion and also your thought? The, how to joining the right organization and how to, start, uh, to make a strategy from the beginning when we are starting for the, uh, our study period? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dijan? Yeah, so everyone has her or his own strategy. For me, the corporate culture was most important. So um, I worked, uh, I started working in Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and the reason I went there instead of other companies was that the management there really cared. I still remember one of the managers, I, I got three offers from three different groups in Hewlett Packard Enterprise when they hired me. And one said, look, uh, most likely you're not going to end up with us, but I will still interview you uh, because I want you to come to work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And so I thought when this kind of manager is willing to go and uh, spend time with me, even though I'm not going to work with him, I want to work in that company. And I've seen cultures in other companies, and I don't want to name them, but there are a lot of companies which are cutthroat, you know, where people are competing, where, you know, different teams are really going after each other. Uh, and I, I just didn't like that. I wanted you work hard, but you collaborate with others. You don't go against the other teams, et cetera. So for me, the culture was important. The other thing to choose was I always chose the company where the work at the location where there's the headquarters. So, for example, if I wanted to work for IBM, I would work on the East Coast. If I wanted to work for Microsoft, I would work in, in Redmond, in Seattle. Uh, I joined Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I joined here on the West Coast. Now, these things are changing, and companies are becoming much more international, and there's a lot of remote work. But uh, these are some of the things. And then uh, there's also how companies behave. Sometimes um, you really want to go and work for a company that you believe is doing the right thing. You know, there are all kinds of observations about this or the other company. And then companies are also changing cultures. You know, some, I remember when I was young uh, and joined Hewlett Packard Enterprise, some were deemed as evil companies because they were dominating the market. They were the one and only. Uh, and they changed over the times. You know, at certain times it was AT&T, it was IBM, it was Microsoft, and uh, the the government would break up these big companies, etc. So you really want to go for the company where you believe that the leadership uh, is is has the same values as you do. These are just some of the examples. Okay, uh, okay, Dr. Bejan, and. Uh... We understood that uh, Professor Shaman uh, mentioned that uh, he also have uh, experience both from the uh, academy and also university. So, uh, what do you thought, uh, Prof. Shaman, about uh, this uh, situation? I don't think I got got it very clearly um, and uh, so you asking me the same question right that you yeah, yes asked. right from your perspective and experience yeah. <laughs> okay sorry so i i agree with um um what dr dejan said in, entirely and uh, and it is also i can also extend that to university administration so and, and academia so uh, i also closely look at what are the, the the leaders of the academia um, doing, and what what are their thoughts? And but of course you don't have a choice. Sometimes you join a university, and the vice chancellor has changed every you know several years. So now um, so sometimes you don't have a cho choice like that. Um, now um, the leadership, the the, the intentions, and uh, so uh, and also how they react to to crisis. And it's important. So I'm I'm just looking at uh, the reactions of various vice chancellors um, to COVID crisis, right? And uh, so, um, and I know some of them, and uh, so I can understand where they come from, and they have different reactions, and so on. So um, now leaders do matter because um, um, top level leaders um, and what they think and how they approach the organization matters. 
it, 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 uh, if it aligns with, um, generally, if it aligns with what you want to do and general principles and, and contribute to society and giving, giving good education, in, in, in my case, and um, thriving research and so on, if that is what the, the leadership um, is keen on doing, and, and also looking after the human um, side of it and the workforce, right? So that's important. So I, as, as Dr. Dejan said that, and he saw this keen interest on, on a manager who wanted to interview with him. Is this, it's similarly, do we see um, um, your leadership looking after um, the workforce that is for an organization, in my view, it is the, is the biggest asset to, to, to the workforce that is doing well and so you need to build them up. So if, if you are a young person joining an institute, uh, organization, university or industry, it doesn't matter. So you need to see what are the um, opportunities, what are the mentorship available, and uh, what are the development opportunities for, for this young person joining. And, and um, so uh, I think you can also ask these things of the organizations. So and certain companies are very well known. Certain universities are very well known for their comprehensive program to to get um, young people in and then and, and develop them um, through uh, various programs. For for us in academia, for example, it is our what we call sabbatical leave. So that's a that's a you know you work for a couple of weeks and then you get a six months. You can go to another university. You can go to industry different country, and then you can be immersed in a different atmosphere, different teaching, learning, research, industry atmosphere, and learn. And then we have uh, something called learn long service leave. For example, I have spent my sabbatical uh, in Singapore, work um, and teaching and doing research in National Technological University. That was a great experience for me, and I have spent my long service leave and uh, working with Ministry of Higher Education in Sri Lanka, helping them with uh, some of the uh, the policies and other things, right? And uh, so, so, uh, and and this different experience enrich you. And so, you, it, it, before joining an organization, it will be good to understand what are the opportunities for me to develop. So, my university offers me to to take up a master's in. Uh, education, which I have never done. So I'm an engineer, so I've never done anything, any form of qualification on education. But the university says, okay, you can do it part-time, it's free, right? So some form of ed educational program. So those are the opportunities, right? Um, so I think I fully agree with Dr. Tejan, just, just providing some examples from my side, from my academia side, and what you should look for before joining um, uh, uh, workplace. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Saman. So uh, we already run off time. Uh, before I uh, make a summarize, uh, I would like to ask one short uh, question to Mr. Uh, Thomas Monaco. Uh, based on the uh, statement that uh, Professor Saman informed that uh, pandemic COVID-19 is really disruptive. So do you think that it is uh, uh, right, and what do you thought about uh, this condition? Dr. Thomas Monaco? Sure, thanks uh, for, for passing it over to me. Um, yeah. Obviously, COVID is incredibly disruptive for academia and industry, um, but in the entrepreneurial world, um, entrepreneurship is kind of all about disruption to a certain extent, right? Um, and so what we're seeing emerge um, are a lot of really great and innovative ideas um, with regard to handle, how to handle big data coming out of the pandemic, um, how to, um, you know, address practical problems like uh, PPE. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, innovation and uh, a lot of really incredible engineering um, in that arena. Um, some of the members of our steering committee 
um, a woman named Samantha Snapes. Um, she's a U.S. Air Force reservist and a, and a create engineer. She makes the world's largest 3D printer. Her company has um, been doing some really great things with regard to uh, printing of PPE and distributing PPE so uh, that you know frontline workers can be um, safe. Um, we're seeing a lot of innovation in the areas of uh, AI, machine learning, computational intelligence, um, so on and so forth, uh, and, and a lot of great research and even, um, you know, a couple companies arise out of the current situation with COVID-19. So whenever there's disruption, there's also significant opportunity. And, you know, on the entrepreneurial front, we're seeing a lot of the uh, engineers that we work with um, in IEEE and outside of IEEE um, really come to the table um, and rise to the occasion with some, you know, incredible uh, responses, um, you know, in, in academia, research, industry, and, you know, on the startup front. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Thomas Monaco, for your thoughts. Yeah, uh, and uh, we would like to summarize uh, all of the discussion from uh, three speakers, as well as the, all of the fun panelists, Dr. Sia Matt and also Dr. Thomas Monaco. Um, there is uh, so many uh, important insights that we have already. Therefore, I would like to uh, highlight uh, at least uh, three uh, points that we have to choose the right areas of profession based on our interests, be happy first, and then try to stay in contribution to the bigger contribution to the society, your nation, as well as uh, your global contribution. And the second, corporate culture is really important uh, to understand and to choose uh, for your uh, future. So uh, please, uh, 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 really uh, consider about uh, on this to choose your right uh, corporation or uh, for the, your future. And the third, uh, uh, be in touch uh, in the great organization like uh, IEEE because it is really important and uh, um, provide more opportunity uh, for our future. And of course, disruption is uh, really significant for our opportunity. So grab and get it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, apologize if there is some limitation from mine. So I uh, deliver to Tara Suchi, Tarasi for the continue uh, this uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Dr. Satrio and Professor Chris for moderating the webinar, um, the panel discussion so well. So um, moving forward with the next item, um, I would like to call Samuel to give a small briefing about the quiz for the participants. So oh, hello participants, you know, it's time for the quiz. Uh, duration of quiz is only three minutes. Link to access the quiz is available in the chat box and already emailed to you as well. So uh, good luck. Thank you very much, Ms. Amil, and good luck to all the participants to um, access the quiz. Okay, so now I would like to um, call Savitya Sivakumar, uh, the RSR, to give a short closing remarks to uh, our lovely um, panelists and moderators. Thank you. Are the slides for me, please? Okay, thanks, Taru. Can you go to the next slides? Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Avitya. I'm the student representative. Um, I would like to say a very big thank you for all our three speakers. Uh, um, I was very excited to listen to the whole session uh, because we are bringing 
three speakers from three uh, areas of uh, IEEE, and I believe that it was useful for all our participants, uh, including me. Um, Taru, can you go to one slide before? Yes. Uh, Dejan, slide. Taru. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Dejan. Uh, uh, I mean, um, I understand that it's very late that you still uh, came here and in person, I mean, delivered the talk and it was very, very interesting. Um, and I believe that our, all our students got some ideas about how to uh, pursue a career in industry and those perspectives. So once again, thank you. And also thanks a lot for um, initiating the collaborations with IEEE Industry Engagement Committee. Um, next slide. Thank you, Prof. Saman. Um, and personally, Prof. Saman, your talk was very helpful for myself as a as a fresh PhD graduate. I'm going to start my career in academics. So yeah, it was very useful, and I believe it's the same for all our attendees as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we're looking forward to listening to your talks in future as well. Um, next slide, uh, Tarul. And thank you, Ken. Yes, uh, unfortunately, Ken she couldn't uh, be here with us to deliver the talk, but I hope uh, Thomas will deliver our sincere thanks to Ken. And also, I want to thank the entire IEEE entrepreneurship team. Um, they were so uh, help helpful for us, even for doing the publicity, creating event pages and all. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Lauren. Please convey my regards to Lauren as well, Thomas. Um, and next slide. And a very big thanks to Prof. Chris and also the Industry Relations Committee of IEEE Region 10. Um, yes, Prof. Chris couldn't uh, be with us for the entire session, so he also helped us with getting um, Dr. Sandrio. Next slide, Taru. So thanks, Dr. Uh, Sandrio, uh, for your uh, presence with us today. Taru, next slide. Taru, next slide. Laptop technical issue, sorry. <laughs> Okay. So, yes, thanks, Dr. Santrio. Taru, can you move on to the next slide, please? Yes, I would also like to thank the entire student team, especially Tarushi. Um, she was very helpful from starting from planning, selecting speakers, uh, creating the whole entire program, and executing it today. And um, thank you so much, Tarushi, for doing everything in terms and even fighting <laughs> against all the odds as well. So next slide. All right, guys, this is our next session for tomorrow. Uh, we'll start 1 p.m. in Bangkok time. It's going to be on IEEE Explore, new services and platforms. Uh, we'll, uh, the speakers will be talking more about uh, the new uh, tools that are related to IEEE Explore, so do not miss it. Uh, Taro, next slide. All right, so coming up next is the networking session. Uh, we'll start like five minutes from now. Uh, we were delayed uh, in completing this session. So five minutes from now, we'll start the networking sessions. It's going to be something quite different from last time. So do join us, guys. Um, uh, and Taru, next slide. And one more time, thanks to all our collaborators, IEEE Entrepreneurship, IEEE Industry Engagement Committee, and Art and Industry Relations Committee, and also HK and Society for collaborating with student activities, uh, student track of SYWSU 2020. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks to our speakers and moderators again, and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.